I think we can start. So welcome to, to the third tourney, the AGN tourney 2020, waiting for the Renaissance. And uh, today we have uh, Monica Colpi chairing Alessandra De Rosa and Alberto Cesana. And the, the talks will be recorded. <clears throat> so the participants already gave their permission. So if you intervene, you know that you will be recorded. And we plan to uh, put the video somewhere to be seen later. Uh, OK, so Monica, it's up to you. So and, welcome uh, to, to this uh, uh, third turn. We have two, today two excellent speakers, Alessandra De Rosa. She spent her time uh, in the hunt of double uh, black holes, uh, dual binaries, just to really try to understand how they really form and how can they can be detected. And the second speaker will be Alberto Cesana, who is leading expert uh, in hunting black holes when they are very, very close uh, to microparsec scales to detect their gravitational waves at low frequencies. And so just uh, please, Alessandra, go ahead with your uh, talk. OK, thanks, Monica. I remind to switch off your videos and microphones so we do not have disturbances during the presentation. Okay, so I'll go. Um, I thank Monica for the presentation and introduction. I thank the organizer for, uh, I mean, for this very useful and, uh, I mean, original <laughs> way to to think about the our uh, usual AGM meeting. I hope you could see and oops, like you could see and look. I do. I did as okay. Sorry, I hope you could see and hear me well. And uh, how we talk about the gravitational universe, actually, Croce Delizial Core, I'm sorry for the Italian, of uh, an EM observer. It looks, it sounds like, uh, I mean, joy and sorrow of an X ray observer, an electromagnetic observer. In fact, I would like to present a personal view of the future of study of massive uh, black hole binaries the next decade. Well, I really a very, very brief introduction. The main topic, the, uh, the main question we have uh, related to massive black hole are what are the origin of massive black hole, how fast they grow, and do seed black hole exist? In order to answer this question, we should consider the long journey of massive black hole emergers. In particular, in the sketch, I saw it by Monica, it's, uh, I mean, it's uh, reported the different phases of black hole separation, of black hole journey, from the um, merger of galaxies uh, through the, through the, um, down to the gravitational wave signal. In particular, we, will, uh, we should know, we, we should investigate the merger with host galaxies at kiloparsec scale, 100 kiloparsec scale separation. We will pass through a dual AGN phase, the pairing phase, in which the black hole are separated over the order of kiloparsec, and they will appear in the sky as dual AGN. Then, when the source, the black holes, became gravitational bound in the Keplerian uh, motion, they will appear as binary AGN and parsec at sub parsec scale separation. It's quite hard to be observed from the electromagnetic counterpart, but they are. And at the end, we will have the microparsec separation, and the source will become the, a gravitational wave emitter. It should be able to be observed with ELISA, for example, in the future. Then, to answer this question, the fundamental question about massive black hole um, evolution and growth, it is mandatory to understand the path of coalescence from galaxy merger up to down to the, 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 the merging and the pairing phase. That means that we should model, simulate, observe this different phase altogether. So it is clear that observing this source from the electromagnetic counterpart point of view will greatly benefit, help the understanding of the gravitational wave signature of these guys. Uh, well, the electromagnetic observer could ask what electromagnetic counterpart could tell us about the massive black hole and how could we develop this kind of synergy with the gravitational waves? Well, in the pre-merger, the um, emission, electromagnetic emission of a binary massive black hole tell us about the merger rate we are expected to observe with LISA. 
So it is very important. Um, at, uh, again, at the pre-merger, after the LISA detection, the evolution of this system will rely on what we have learned about electromagnetic counterparts, where the systems are very close, so in the final stage of merging. At the end, in this spiral phase, the electromagnetic counterpart tell us about how the gas behaves uh, under variable space-time and will tell us about strong field gravity, so fundamental physics. There is a clear link among the what we are expected to observe from the electromagnetic counterparts of these guys. Well, I hope this sketch is not too busy. I would like to, I mean, to put it in a context. I ask myself what ha will happen in 2033, 2034, when Lisa will see his first detection. We will have, of course, the sky localization, the, this chain of the, from the detection to the science has been proved and investigated very deeply. We will have a sky localization, the position we will be updated about each two days. Then a follow-up campaign will start. This follow-up campaign, of course, will strongly depend on what space telescope or ground-based telescope we will have available. It will depend on the characteristic of these telescopes, that means field of view, sensitivity, slow rate, how long exposure we will like to devote to observe gravitational wave counterparts. This is from on one side, but the other side, it will be strongly, it will be, I mean, imperative to know how model works, how model um, reproduce the merging of this uh, monster in the sky. Up to now, we have some modeling of emission. I'll be back to this point in a couple of slides, in which we expected to observe electromagnetic signal in a form of bright optical and X-ray um, emission and modulation. And then, after the detection and the follow-up, these two parts of the study will go all together. Of course, we will have the best electromagnetic detection depending on what we will know about the system that are merging. For example, we know that the, the best electromagnetic counterpart will be, I mean, observable for the heaviest asymmetric black hole mass, I mean, Q uh, more or less 10. And it also has been investigated that this is better, it's more efficient to wait for a sky localization better than 20 square degree before going for some follow-up study. Then we will have the opportunity to investigate pre-merger, merger state, or post-merger region. Once this chain um, has, been, has, been, um, has been performed, we, will, we could answer to our original question about the massive black hole. And this will strongly depend on the, on the modeling we have of this guy. However, most of the science, I mean, most, some of the science, but uh, um, a large amount of the science can be also can be done now, looking at the electromagnetic archives or new observation, because the model we would like to test and check are, are I mean, could be applied to um, already existing data and uh, could be probed with the particularly, I mean, I would say uh, time expensive, full, uh, time expensive observational programs right now. This point is very important because once we will conclude this chain of observation, we will have some answer about the behavior of uh, merging supermassive black hole. We will have then very important information about the LISA merger rate, the population study of the source that will be the best target for LISA. So these two parts of the study cannot be separated. But while this chain has been highly optimized, and I'm sure Alberto will talk about this more deeply, this part of the chain has not been optimized yet. So part of my talk, it will be a very personal view of what we can do today to, make, uh, to have a better understanding of what's happening here that could be, in the future, the starting point to better understand and to maximize the science, the wonderful science that we will have available with LISA. On this part, I would like just to stress something in particular, I will stress some caveats from the observational point of view, because I'm, I'm, I'm sure Alberto will talk more about this. So, uh, about the, 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 I mean the, the multi-messenger and the costly gravitational wave, wave and electromagnetic universe, of course, the best will be to observe the events, the pre-merger events when the 
the source an dual AGN phase and uh, galaxy mergen or binary or binary Keplerian orbit. This could be possible with the Erosita, LST, Athena, Lynx, a lot of feasibility study has been performed. What we know, however, from the visibility is that the sky localization will, Lisa, will improve with the signal to noise. Then, of course, errors uh, will go lower at merger. So, a lot of source could be observed at merger or post merger, and some source, some event could be observed even during the, sp the spiral phase. This is a very clear plot by Alberto Mangiaghi, um, just investigated the sky localization um, as a function of time before the merger for different mass ratio and configuration of the system. Uh, as an observer, we try to understand uh, the, I mean, the sensitivity capability we will have at least at time with, this, uh, with the instrument we will have available. Here there is a table with the mass of the merging black hole, the redshift, and the X-ray estimated X-ray flux uh, with different assumption of what we are going to observe. Here in particular, we take into consideration 110 of adding to luminosity, the idea adding to luminosity. However, you, you could see that the numbers are more or less okay and are well below the, um, I mean the, the, the sensitivity limit of the future measure, so we are okay. The point is about the sky localization. So, um, time, this is the sky localization at merger. So the best, for example, observational strategy could be to look at the region of the event with um, wide um, field of view instrument like Vera Rubin monitoring or SCA, and then follow up the source with a narrow field instrument like Adina or Lynx. This would be at merger. Before the merger, here I just put a box in which you could see that it could be quite hard to do, to do something, but we cannot exclude this should be possible although it seems quite hard for now, but at merger and um, the post-merger will be bright, will be great. In fact, we took into consideration the instrument, in particular the X-ray I took here because it's my main expertise, and because the model tells us that X-ray source will be bright. And if you look at the field of view on the instrument, here I took Irosita, uh, the wi instrument of Agina and Lynx, and sensitivity, we are, we are well within the limit of the events at merger. So, yes, we can follow the, the, the post-merger event once that Lisa will detect it. Even more than this, here there is the resolving power of the X-ray emission as a function of the redshift. Of course, with this resolving power, we cannot resolve the separation of binary system, the top parsec of sub parsec, but it will be fundamental to investigate the behavior of the matter once the galaxies start the, the process of coalescence. I mean, the, the phase of the dual AGN, I was talking at the beginning of the talk. And the future will be bright even uh, under this point of view, following this point of view. A caveat on this, uh, I mean, on this uh, strategy is the fact that we know that there is a link among obscuration and merging. Here uh, there is, uh, I mean, two different plots of separation and absorption as uh, observed in, with um, X-ray observation of dual AGN sample in the plot below, and a sample of AGN or non-AGN pairs with respect to dual AGN. You, you could easily see that the trend seems to suggest that with a closer separation, the obscuration increase. So it seems that when the merging starts and there is the final stage or the early stage of the merging, the obscur obscuration uh, in the system seems to increase. And this should be uh, a, an input that we could, we should consider when talking about simulation and what we are expecting to observe with the future X-ray emission. The, the evidence of the link with the obscurationist merger is even, in, even more clear when looking at, um, at a, a large survey in which you could see here would you can see the NH as a function of distribution of the source, and you could see that the early merger are less obscure respect to uh, late merger uh, system. Okay, so now let's center in what should be possible to do now. So the most, in, I mean, in my view, most interesting part of the talk from my point of view as, as an observer. So what we can do now to be prepared to the LISA science? 
Well, there is clear possibility to detect, to detect massive black hole now with the electromagnetic counterpart before they enter in the Giza band. What do we want to know? We want to know fundamental information about these electromagnetic events. So the merger rate, that could be the input for the science we will do with LISA. We would like to know the orbital parameter distribution because we know that depending on this orbital parameter, we are, we are expecting to observe different signatures in the electromagnetic uh, domain. We would like to characterize the, the supermassive black hole population that are, of course, the main target of LISA in the face of its piling. So let's prepare now to maximize the LISA output, the LISA contribution to astrophysical black hole evolution and formation. So the point is, we want good massive black hole binary candidates. And we want to spend a lot of time investigating these guys. So we should start from the model. We, I mean, we no, don't know, we I haven't seen yet how merging of supermassive black hole behavior. However, there are models uh, in which uh, the final stage of the merger uh, will form a circumbinary disk. Uh, they will form also, a, 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 I mean, the tidal force will try to empty the inner part of the merging system, but this don't prevent the, the, the stream of gas to form this mini disk all around each supermassive black hole. So there are mini disks, uh, more or less quite similar to the one observed in single quasar. So in this configuration, uh, a periodic modulation of the accretion stream is inevitable. And in addition, there is also Doppler boosting caused by the fact that the emission from a mini disk has been gravitational uh, enhanced when the, it passed through the mini disk of the other supermassive black hole. So what we are expecting to observe is an enhanced optical X-ray emission from the two quasar in the region going from 10, 100 gravitational radii, emission from this, this mini disk, and the simulation tells us that we are expecting this variability depending on the simulation of the, of the separation of the system, what we is uh, here in the... You could, could you see my cursor in the screen? Yes. Sir. Yeah. Okay, great. And um, so we are expecting to observe the modulation as well as the spike, depending on the Doppler boost of the motion of the system. From the, from the spectroscopical point of view, then the X-ray chirp is, uh, as it's called X-ray chirp, is inevitable. We should observe this feature. So we have model. In particular, here I put two differ different, I mean, they are quite similar model, all, always uh, taking into consideration the circle and binary disk, as well as the mini disk around each supermassive black hole. In a, in a, in a model by Dascoli Collaborator 2018, it is said that the most of the X-ray emission is in a, ter in a form of a non-thermal corona here, and most of the emission is in the UV band, soft X UV band, and uh, we will see this therma, huge thermal emission with respect to the single AGM. However, here it seems that there is a simple treatment of the thermodynamics of the model that somehow force the disk to be the mini disk to be a bit cooler than expected. Another model reported here, proposed by Tang, a collaborator 2018, predicts instead that the, the most of the emission will be in the soft and the hard disk band. And uh, the main diff is over, is, um, also in this case, you would see the total emission in red, here the circumbinary disk, the mini disk that will have the main contribution in the soft in the X-ray band. And the main difference with this model here is, I mean, uh, is the thermodynamics. And in this part, it seems, uh, as the, also the author said, that some, uh, I mean, uh, realist, if it is possible to reach some realistic high accretion rate. However, we have model. We should, this model should be improved, but we have model. And uh, this same model are uh, predicting very fast, uh, a very high variability, uh, well before the merging, up to the merging. Here, the light curves uh, at the beginning, uh, at the end of the spiral fa spiraling phase detected by ELISA, and at exactly at 2 kb at 10 kb. You can see that we should be able to observe this feature. It's good candidate are, candidate are observed. So the question is, 
find good massive black hole candidates now. So we know that there are very good way to look for candidates. For, ex for example, I was thinking to spectroscopic search in the optical region with the broadening of the broad line, the offset, the variability of this line or the peculiar ratio among different broad, ion li broad line in the two candidates. But of course, this is, this is related to high black hole masses, uh, subparsec separation, the close, uh, close zeta. But the most important point is that this signature is not unique. We heard yesterday a very intriguing talk about the wind and how it flows. And this could be, I mean, reproduce, this could, the, this um, spectroscopic tool could be also um, an artifact of this fast out of love, for example. Alexandra, uh, you have only two minutes. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you. The other part is related to the variability. There is the broad ion light variability emitting in the inner part of the disk 10 100 gravitational radii for the two black holes. This is a very fundamental point. The, the, the big disadvantage of this is that the X-ray AGN is very complex. The K-line region is rich of spectral features. It's not easy to disentangle this emission, but it is possible. And the other one is coming from photometric modulation. So the light curve is changing with the periodic modulation. But even in this case, we should consider that AGN are variable. The point is that AGN are variable. We still don't know how they vary in the detail. Here there are these I mean, this plot reporting the data from photometric variability and the model that has been reproduced as a binary supermassive black hole. The same data with the same sampling has been reproduced in this case with the same modulation, but considering a light curves for an AGN, the pink lines, that is just red noise, two different red noise, the B and the C panel. That means that in this case, the model is a periodic, but the, a periodicity. But here, the real model is not periodicity. The point is that the low signal to noise and the sampling, the pattern of the sampling, do not, does not allow to give us any solid answer. So the periodicity could be false, but the periodicity could even be true. The point is that the AGN are variable, and we know there are variability. Yesterday, Margherita told us about very strange, a huge variability of the AGN. So even in this case, this could not be the final answer, but could be a, a, a way to look for candidate. So how we could we to be prepared for the ESA events? From the theoretical point of view, we should better investigate this variability. And in particular, we should develop methods to identify periodic and mixed stochastic processes. Because even if we are observing a periodic variability, coming from a binary, even in that case, we should observe the red noise of AGN. So we should mimic a mixed process. We should account for real emission in a spectral evolution, even in the circumbinary mini disk scenario. From the observational point of view, well, for the observational point of view, my personal view is that we should go for exploratory observational programs to confirm or reject these candidates. We will have three great benefits of this. First of all, we could be able to check the emission model because we do not have any other view till now, till Lisa, to look for this. We could verify the goodness of this selection, for example, through the optical periodicity. This is important because this population will be the population that Lisa will observe. And finally, in the case, for example, of the ion line variability, we could check the visibility with the future Lagera instrument, think to our genome links. About periodicity, we should improve our understanding of the quasar noise. Uh, we should improve the search of out outliers once we know the variability. These outliers will be our best candidate. So the suggestion is go wider, to a large sample of candidates, for example, with the uh, Verarabin LSST. So it will be possible to calibrate false periodicity. And then we will recognize the true variable source. So these are my very personal and, uh, I mean, biased recommendation. And we will close and saying that the future is bright, at least for AGN, but the present is even better in my view. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Alessandra. So I ask the audience to keep note of the question they are willing to address. 
Meantime, Alberto Cesana has to prepare his knife and uh, just show up with this presentation. Okay, wait a second. I, I, I behave and I put, a, I put a clock on, so I go for 20 minutes. Eh? Okay, uh, my screen, share. Do, 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 do. Okay, great. Uh, start. Start a presentation. Okay. All right. So, um, and thanks for, to Alessandro for the for the very nice uh, uh, overview. Let's say most focused on the on the electromagnetic side. Um, I, I'm going to discuss you know, opportunity for for multi messenger astrophysics of involving massive black holes and massive black hole binaries with with future. Uh, gravitational wave uh, uh, experiments. So, since uh, you know, these uh, we all know that uh, uh, how well, what is our understanding of, of galaxy formation and evolution, and this proceeds uh, in a hierarchical uh, fashion. Okay, as you see in this uh, in this merger tree cartoon here, and we know that in the in the in the core of galaxies there are massive black holes, uh, and uh, during the merger process of the galaxy, massive black hole binaries are likely to form, but as we as we heard from from my standard talk, uh, you know we don't know much about those binaries. We don't know um, we don't know how these massive black holes first form, how they seed form. We don't know exactly how they accrete uh, along the cosmic history. Of course, we have hints from the plasma luminosity function and other things. We know that they accrete most of the mass by accretion, but we don't know what is the role of mergers, for example, in their evolution and so on and so forth. Right, and. Hopefully, the answer to, to many of these questions will come from gravitational waves uh, detection in the in the near, <laughs> hopefully, not, hopefully not so far future. Okay, so that, let me talk just a second about gravitational waves. Right, very simply, if you have two masses to that, that accelerate around the common center of mass, they produce a time variable distortion of the space time that expands out, outwards, is uh, transported outwards as a gravitational wave that travels the speed of light. So you can depict this wave as uh, uh, this, this, this cartoon here at the bottom, as the binary is in spiraling, the wave amplitude increases and the frequency also increases. So you have, you have a chirp, okay? And the amplitude and the frequency of the wave depends on the property of the binary. In particular, the, if you take a binary of compact objects close to merger, the amplitude of the wave is essentially proportional to their mass, and the frequency is, in, is essentially inversely proportional to their mass. So, small mass binary have small amplitude and high frequency, and high mass binary have higher amplitude and smaller frequency. And that's why to observe uh, massive local binaries, we need to move away from the kilohertz gravitational wave range that has been probed by LIGO and Virgo. Okay, so we need to go in space with the laser interferometer space antenna that is probing gravitational wave in the milliards regime, or we need precise timing of uh, millisecond pulsars, which provides another way to observe gravitational wave as frequencies as low as nanohertz. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit about opportunities for uh, multi messenger observation and what we can learn uh, with both experiments. Okay. All right, let's talk about, let's start with Lisa. So Lisa is a, you're in my calendar. <laughs> Lisa is, is, a, is, is a laser, is a space-based laser interferometer that is uh, orbiting around the sun, trailing the earth, as in the picture here. And it's sensitive, it's going to be sensitive to gravitational wave in the Milliards regime, okay? Um, is a mission that is currently in the books of ESA, the European Space Agency, and is due to fly in the early 2030s. So, you know, far in the future, but not so far. The primary sources of gravitational waves for LISA include supermassive black hole binaries that are those uh, red, dark red tracks here. Okay, and you see, you can see this system with signal to noise ratios that are up to several thousand. So, you can really detect this systems very loudly in the uh, in the detector. Now, this is essentially your money plot for for Lisa, and I could you know I could spend the rest of my talk on this plot. So what you show here, what you see here, is uh, you have mass 
on the x-axis, well, logarithm of mass, and redshift on the y-axis. And the counterplots are signal-to-noise ratios of which Lisa, with which Lisa can see a binary of a given mass at a given redshift, okay? And so you see that essentially our detector can see system between few thousand up to few tens of millions solar masses anywhere in the universe, okay? This is, you know, the first structure formation of redshift 20 or so is up here, okay? So you see that Lisa, in, you know, because of this, Lisa provides a complementary view of the massive black hole evolution uh, with respect to what you can achieve with electromagnetic instruments where you know you can see quasar today out to redshift six seven those are the most massive system here uh, we will perhaps go up to redshift 10 in the in the with future facilities we can push down the mass at with you know the mass threshold at which we can see the systems but, you know, it's, it's very likely that we will, will be able to see a 10 to the 5 massive black hole accreting in the redshift 10 or so, right? So, really, the, the beauty of LISA is the, and, and electromagnetic observation is that there is a nice complementarity and also a large overlap region. Okay, what you see here are also tracks of typical supermassive black hole growing in the universe. So, each track is a system from a simulation, okay, and each dot is a merger. So, essentially, you see that, that you know, it doesn't really matter if you're looking at your Milky Way type black hole or a typical quasar or Rashi 2 or a typical progenitor of a quasar or Rashi 6. Lisa, all of them will cut through the Lisa window and Lisa will essentially catch any single merger happening in the universe for, of course, for the period that is flying and is observing, okay? So, but another important thing is that what Lisa sees is a, a specific, very biased subset of events. So, those are merging binaries. So, there might be a completely, you know, well, they, they might be biased compared, of course, to the population of, uh, for example, um, you know, quasars that we see in the universe because most quasars are likely to be lone black holes, okay? So, and it, it's important to understand that what we're seeing with LISA might be a very biased subpopulation of the massive black hole binary, of the massive black hole population. So, we need to connect, to connect the two, okay? So, let's see. So, this uh, similar slide was shown already by, by Alessandra and you see here essentially what we expect to see uh, for emerging uh, massive black holes. So in the center, you see a typical, the typical signal, the chirping signal with the amplitude that is getting higher as the, as the signal proceeds and the frequency that is increasing. Okay, this binary is likely to be surrounded by gas, so you might have this circumbinary disk, uh, circumbinary disk uh, um, picture that uh, Alessandra showed before. And there might be a number of signatures preceding the merger of the system, for example, variability of the signal at different wavelengths, perhaps in optical, in UV, and most likely also in the X-ray. Um, however, at some point, the, the, the evolution because of gravitational wave emission is going to be faster than what the gas can keep up with, okay? So essentially, you have a decoupling. You might have a decoupling between the binary and the gas, and what you see in this, you know, here is that the luminosity of the signal, the accretion rate and, and luminosity is decreasing as you approach merger, and perhaps the signal can be, the, the system can be quite dim at merger itself. But then this is because of the quadrupolar torque of the binary that opens a cavity in the disk. This quadrupolar torque, of course, ceases to exist when the binary merges, and then you can have, uh, uh, the gas can fall in again, and then you can have a rebrightening of an EGN. So you might expect distinctive signature pre-merger, you know, perhaps a dim system and merger, or perhaps not, depends on the models here, and a rebrightening and maybe, you know, a launching of a jet post-merger. So there might be a series of interesting counterparts and signature that you might observe. Um, on the LISA side, essentially, you are doing like this baby here, right? You have a series, you know, the, the gravitational waveform encodes the properties of your source, including the position in the sky, okay? And in particular, with LISA, we will be able to measure 
most properties of these binaries, the masses, perhaps their spins, and most importantly, the sky, the location in the sky. And if you know where a system is in the sky, then you can devise synergies with other observatories that are going to be there. For example, the Athena mission or, you know, LSST, I just take a, as, as, as two examples. So you all know what uh, Athena and LSST are, are going to be. So for, for the purpose of our, of our talk, it's important to know that Athena is going to go very deep in terms of sensitivity, in the, in the, both in the, in, the, in the soft and hard X. And, it, and the WFI on board is going to have a field of view of, you know, order of point of half square degree. Okay, so which is relatively large, especially for, for, for an X-ray instrument. LSST is an optical telescope and is going to cover with, uh, with this field of view about 10 square degrees. So, you know, it's actually very well suited for uh, um, coupling with gravitational wave uh, um, detectors, which are known for not not having a particularly good sky localization for electromagnetic standards. So let me take an example, okay? So what you see here is a relatively low, this is just 3, 10 to the 5 massive, uh, mass, solar masses, binary at small redshift, okay? 0 0.3. Perhaps we're going to see something like this, perhaps not, okay? And this is essentially how the sky localization accuracy is going to improve as you approach merger, okay? The, 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 the line in the center here is the average over you know, several thousands of realizations. So you see that already a month before merger for this system, you can actually localize the system within a LSST field of view. So perhaps what you can do, you can actually continue to point regularly that, uh, that area in the sky to look for over you know, a month, essentially, for a source that show any signs of evolving periodicity that matches the gravitational wave um, um, frequency and phase evolution, which are going to have extremely well from the gravitational wave measurement. Okay, when you enter then, when you approach the merger, let's say you know perhaps a day, a few hours before merger, the system will enter the Athena field of view, and then you can actually point Athena and see whether. You, can, you have any interesting signature in X-ray even before merger, okay? So you can devise this two-tier strategy where you try to narrow down your candidates or perhaps find uh, a, an interesting candidate already with LSST and then stare with Athena already before merger, okay? So this is the best case scenario. Problem is that, you know, you have a very low redshift system here. If you go higher in redshift, really you see that you get, so those are system at redshift two or three, you see that really you get in the LSST field of view like Howard, perhaps the day before merger, and with Athena, you can only pin down the source within one field of view of Athena just after merger, because after the merger, the, you know, at the merger, the signal to noise ratio increases a lot in gravitational wave observation, and the field of view uh, and, and, and the sky localization improves dramatically from gravitational waves. So this plot here shows uh, a, a, an overlap of contours of uh, uh, sky localization of LISA. So for example, this green line here, all the, la all the system below this green line here can be localized with LISA uh, within 0.4 square degree at merger, okay? And the gray scale is essentially how long you have to stare at that patch of the sky with Athena in order to see, essentially, let's say, Eddington limited accretion in X-ray uh, for a black hole of that mass at that ratio. So you see that the overlap region is quite large. So, for example, you might see system between a million and 10 million solar masses up to redshift two, perhaps, okay, with Athena in post merger if they rebright as a loud quasar, okay, as a bright quasar. So, really, with Athena, the pre merger um, synergy is perhaps very difficult to achieve, but post merger, you might have a very large portion of the parameter space where you can get signals both in gravitational waves and in the electromagnetic spectrum. And this is a very exciting prospect. LISA is not going to see only supermassive black hole binaries. And 
I want to spend uh, a couple of minutes also talking about another source, which are extreme maceration spirals. So we know that these massive black holes reside in the center of galactic nuclei, which are very dense, and massive black holes at the center of these nuclei can capture compact objects quite frequently. And if they capture, for example, a stellar mass black hole, the system will emit gravitational wave. The small stellar mass black hole will slowly spiral and will merge with the central object. These things are called extreme maceration spirals for obvious reasons, right? You have a black hole of, let's say, medium solar mass at the center, and the spiraling object is perhaps 10 solar masses. So why those systems are interesting? So first of all, they provide a much less biased sample with respect to massive black hole binaries, right? Because you don't need to have an accretion, you don't need to have a merging binary system, okay? Any lone black hole in any galaxy can have a small black hole in spiraling around it, okay? So these systems might provide a very nice population to complete the massive black hole mass function below 10 to the 6 solar masses where uncertainties are huge. Okay? And in fact, if you look at what Lisa can see, these are the, 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 the contour plots here for two different waveforms. There are uncertainties here, but Lisa will see essentially any black hole in spiraling into a massive black hole between 100,000 and 5 million solar masses out to redshift one or so. Okay, so extreme maceration spirals might provide a very nice way to probe the massive black hole mass function at low at the low end. Really, these are fantastic uh, probes because so I, I just take here an example. So this is the error that you have on the spin measure on the measurement of the spin of this black hole, and you see the numbers here are quite remarkable: ten to the minus four, ten to the minus six. So you, you, you can pin down the spin, but also the mass of the central black hole exactly, okay? Even more interesting in terms of uh, synergies is the fact that some of these extreme maceration spirals might happen in active galactic nuclei. So if there is a dense uh, accretion disk around the massive black hole, this disk can capture star and black holes and force them to co-rotate with the disk, okay? they will be driven to the center and they will form extreme maceration spirals. Or perhaps that star, massive stars can form themselves in the outskirts of the disk and then they can migrate into the center, form black hole, and these black hole can, pro can be extreme maceration spirals, but within the disk. What is interesting about those systems? What is interesting is that now these extreme maceration spirals don't happen in vacuum. So the phase evolution of the system which you can measure very well with gravitational wave, is going to be different. And you might recognize that a given memory is not occurring in vacuum, but is occurring in a dense environment because its gravitational waveform doesn't match a, a, a vacuum gravitational waveform. So here, the interesting thing might be the following. You can see several, suppose you see several extreme maceration spirals with Lisa. And you recognize one that doesn't match GR, but it matches a model where the system is evolving in a dense medium. So you know, okay, this extreme maceration spiral here is going to hap is happening in a dense uh, AGN disk. Now you point in the location of the sky that Lisa tells you, which is going to be better than a square degree with, for example, Athena or whatever else you have. And, you know, there are going to be probably hundreds of galaxies in there, but, you know, there are not going to be that many active galaxies, okay? So you might actually recognize what's, what is the host. And that would be super exciting if you can confirm that because the electromagnetic observation tells you about, of course, the appearance of the system. The gravitational wave signal is telling you exact, essentially exactly the mass and the spin of the central black hole. And the emery is like a test particle that is proving the density in the mid-plane of the disk, which is something that for an optically thick disk, you were never going to measure otherwise. Okay, So you, you might actually have a measurement of the mid-plane density of the disk, its observational appearance, and the mass spin of the accreting object. You know, it might be over-optimistic, but there's a real chance of doing this.
And in my last couple of minutes, I want to talk about uh, what happens uh, at much lower frequency in the pulsar timing range. Okay, so pulsar timing is essentially the art of timing millisecond pulsars. So these are very precise clocks, okay, for, any, for our purposes. And what you know, what you have, if you have a very precise clock and there is a gravitational wave passing between you and the clock, the space between you and the clock will be squeezed and squashed and your, the ticks of your clock will arrive a little bit earlier and a little bit later. So they are essentially, you know, gravitational wave detectors in their own, okay? One interesting, so with, with these uh, pulsars, we're going to detect gravitational wave in the, in the nanohertz frequency. And the signal is going to be provided by a superposition of uh, inspiraling supermassive black hole binaries. And the, it might look something like this. So this is frequency, this is the amplitude, and each triangle here is a source. So you see, there might be very loud source that sticks out of the overall signal. So you might detect them individually, okay? Now, it turns out that the sky localization of pulsar timing is not spectacular. And you see an example in the plot here, okay? So we are talking about tens of square degrees. And within tens of square degrees, since you don't have essentially any information about the distance, there are, you know, millions of galaxies. However, if you see this, see if you have seen this signal with the PTA, it means necessarily that this is a massive nearby system. So you can easily cut in the mass distance plane the subpopulation of galaxies that can be the host of this system. And in this plot here, I essentially highlighted the system that constitute the 50% probability of being the host and the 90% probability. We are talking about tens of perhaps hundreds of system. And it's not that hard to follow up on tens or hundreds very massive galaxies to look for peculiar signatures. Again, you've seen already a picture like this. You have a binary and a circumbinary disk and you can have all sort of signatures, variability, uh, double K alpha lines, so on and so forth. Now, the advantage of this is that those systems are not going to be 100,000 or perhaps a million solar mass binary redshift tree. They're going to be billion solar mass binary redshift less than one. Okay, so really, a job, the job of the observer is going to be much easier there. All right, so let me just conclude here. I just want to, you know, give you, uh, talk a little bit about my, my, my take on this, which is that, you know, LISA plus Satina and all, or LSST might observe massive black hole binaries in the gravitational wave and electromagnetic spectrum uh, in the future. And this will place very, you know, constraints on the massive black hole assembly that are not going, are, you know, are impossible to, to place otherwise. We might witness the emergence of a quasar in the post-merger phase, perhaps, and we might uh, uh, be able to study accretion physics on, on systems with known properties, because we're going to know the masses and the spins of the binaries. However, the population of massive black hole binaries is going to be heavily biased compared to the population of, of quasars that you usually used for building up your, uh, you know, quasar luminosity function, because those are merging systems. So we need to connect the two population. Extreme mass spirals, on the other hand, can be more unbiased tracers, in a sense that, you know, there is no particular reason, there is no preferential uh, uh, reason for a massive black hole to host an embryo, okay? So any lone black hole can have an extreme mass spiral, so they will be extremely useful to constrain the low mass end of the massive black hole mass function. And if they occur in an accretion disk, they can unveil a lot of properties of accretion disk themselves that are impossible to prove otherwise. And finally, pulsar timing sources are massive nearby and might be very easily identified in the electromagnetic windows. Now, consider that if galaxies experience a major merger in their lifetime, you might expect that one galaxy every thousand harbor a massive black hole binary in the pulsar timing band. Okay, so with a single counterpart detection, might be a Rosetta Stone and the key to access a population of thousands, hundreds of thousands of massive black hole binaries 
that are essentially hiding in plain sight in uh, AGN and active galaxy spectra right now. And Roberto, I, I have to. Uh, yeah, I'm done. Your time is over. <laughs> so, uh, really, thanks a lot for these two kind talks. The future is really bright for discovering binary black holes, and it's time to take questions. Uh, I don't see uh, any message. Is there anybody who's willing to address a question, maybe just a switching on the microphone? Maurizio can Maurizio, ask. Please ask, uh, go ahead and ask a question, just unmute yes, uh, you. I, I always wonder when I see these uh, talks about gravitational waves, if the number of uh, sources that we expect to detect in the high redshift universe is such that uh, we will be able to see the individual signal or uh, in, or if instead we will be able to see a, a diffuse background of gravitational waves, more similar to the X-ray background that we discovered, uh, you know, a while ago, because of the superposition of many events over a large fraction of the universe. So I guess that's maybe mostly for me. Um, it really depends on on your detector. Um, for example. Uh, with LISA that observes uh, at relatively high frequency, you are observing the final spiral and merger of these systems. So even if there are many such systems at the same time in your detector, let's say in the space of signals, they are essentially orthogonal to each other. So you are essentially always going to be able to disentangle each individual massive black hole binary. So with LISA, really what you're going to see are the uh, it's the evolution of individual system and you can uh, uh, identify each of them individually things are different for uh, pulsar timing when you're talking about the the, the nano earth frequency band there really your uh, the resolution capability essentially of your system of your detector is much is much smaller plus your sources are essentially uh, monochromatic so there is you know, they're not evolving much in frequency and it's very hard to disentangle them from each other. And in fact, what you really expect to detect in pulsar timing, at least the first signal that you expect to detect, is a, you know, this is essentially a red noise that is given by the incoherent superposition of several binaries. But there is a chance that few of these systems sticks out of the of the background and you might resolve them individually which is what i was alluding to in my talk but you know an unresolved background is the likely first signal that you're going to see at nano earth frequencies thanks other questions um i i have a question but it's, it's very naive yeah, for uh, yeah for alessandra i mean um Okay, maybe I, I missed something, but it's a very, very simple question. Um, can you say something about the expected number of uh, binaries, black hole binaries, uh, from the black hole pace? I don't even know how is the observational situations about, uh, you know, black hole pace that have been uh, identified or measured. So is there any work uh, in this direction? But if you, are, if you are, um, are considering the real pairs, that means already in Keplerian, um, Keplerian motion, one with respect to the other, so they are not resolved, for example, by imaging spectroscopy. Mm -hmm. There are a few in the terms of a few in the sense of a couple of three, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, so in this sense, we should realize in the indirect uh, I mean signature, like the variability, or uh, there are a lot of candidates token from the in the, the, the method I, I try to show that means the mm -hmm. the, the um, photometric variability uh, the the ion line is starting to do something with the, the, the very recent work uh, a, lo a lot means how many the candidates are the lot of uh, for example the one with the, the the photometric in the blue band I showed something like of the hundred. Mm -hmm. 
and then you should in a sense try to uh, to catch up the, the i mean to, to select the best candidate the best candidate could be the ones that are the best periodicity to be observed uh, to be observed with the uh, i mean in an x-ray for example uh, which are the chance probability to be a false periodicity very low or the ones in which for example the periodicity is suggesting that uh, the separation it's smaller, smaller of few gravitational radii because, for example, a preliminary work in X-ray has been done in this case. It has been shown that the plot I showed about what we are expecting to observe from the X-ray spectra of binaries, the ones in the hard X-ray band of the two mini disks. It seems that this feature could be greatly highlighted once the system are at a closer separation that means a few gravitational radii one with respect to the other so in this sense you should i mean among your candidates select the best one in order to make an effective observational program and then ask for some reasonable time of exposure with the i don't know chandra xmm or whatever mm -hmm. there is okay there is roberto the who is willing to ask a, a related question. Yeah, um, thanks to, to both the speakers, first of all. Um, I, I had a question basically following up on, on Paulus, and basically the question is, um, you, you're talking about uh, you know, down-selecting candidates, and I was wondering uh, uh, what would be the smoking gun evidence that uh, you have a, a binary? uh well it's a very quite hard question because uh, uh we know that in uh, i mean in this we have a different suggestion uh coming from different wavelengths and uh we understood that uh, some of them uh, should uh, yeah i saw alberto saying the British <laughs> yeah from the electromagnetic point of view we learned that we really should try to, I mean, to, to put the, the scenario all together because from, I mean, from the optical, you could have an outflow. From the X-ray, you could, I mean, mimic the hard X-ray with the reflection. Uh, in the radio, has been proposed something of these, uh, I mean, the precession jets. But even in this case, it's been proposed that maybe it is something different related to the blob emission. So um, if I should, I mean, uh, uh, the, the, um, now what I have to say that uh, I don't think it's my personal opinion that uh, it will be, there is now a smoking gun, but try to make um, deeper this study that in my view, it's really that the, I mean, it's, it's, the, it's not the, 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 the peak of the iceberg, it's even less because we do not have observational program of these candidates. Each time we try to ask is something like it's too risky. And so um, I think we will have the answer to your question if some uh, observational strategy will we start now. For Thanks. Okay, so we have last, uh, you read it from Alex Razim. It says, um, mm, Although gravitational wave have very small amplitude, they have near constant frequency for the long periods of time. Is it possible that gravitational wave can provoke some sort of resonance effects in the nearby rotating systems? I mostly think about it by association with that effect when bridges uh, destruction may start from the marking people or with gravitational resonances in planetary systems? I guess this is a question that Alberto can answer quickly. Um, yeah, so, there, uh, so the, the, the short answer to this question is that it's very, uh, it's very unlikely. Uh, and the reason is the same reason why it's so difficult to detect gravitational waves, that they couple extremely weakly with matter. So there has been actually some study um, investigating the possible amplific the possible effect uh, of uh, uh, shocks induced uh, by the passage of gravitational waves within uh, a dense disk. So as you as you are suggesting, if you have a gravitational wave, uh, a persistent source of gravitational wave, and this modifies the, the, the you know squeezes and squashes essentially 
the, the accretion disk that is around the binary, this might use shocks and, uh, and uh, provoke the disk to become brighter. Um, this is some word that has, I think, uh, Ben Cox's and Avi Loeb and others uh, worked on this several years ago. But, uh, you know, given how weakly gravitational waves couple with matter, the result was that, uh, you know, it, it's, essentially, it's essentially negligible. So for, at least for, for what I know, this is very, very unlikely. Okay, I think that we are over. Time is running out. So let me thank the speakers again. Clap, clap. And uh, see you next uh, to the next uh, turn, eh? Yes, tomorrow we're going to have uh, Roberto Maiolino and uh, Michaela Hirschman with Francesca Panessa chairing. So, so we reconvene tomorrow at 3 p.m. Thanks, Thanks to everybody. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks, Bye. Thanks, Thanks, Alberto. Ciao. 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 Bye.